Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. Bells on bobtail rings, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a sing song tonight. Oh, oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Open say Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open say Dashing through the snow in a one horse open say O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. Some bobtail rings are making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a singing song tonight. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Open sleigh. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's United Methodist Church. We're so glad to be in worship together. We're kind of leaning this way. I'm like, <laughs> the side is also open for business if anybody wants to sit over here. Um, uh, it is a good day to be together the second Sunday of Advent. What a gift to, to wait for Jesus coming into this world, to, to wait together as a church. Um, uh, for hope, peace, joy, and love to be realized everywhere. Um, a few announcements I would like to make. Um, I would love for, first, let us know you're here. Can you go back to that one? If you guys haven't signed in as you walked in, we'd love to know you're here. So you can scan that code. It'll be up at the end, too, and it cycles through. So you can do that later as well. Or connect. There's iPads on the way in and out. So please do that. And then we have all of our Advent and Christmas happenings. You can scan that code and see more about what is to come as well, the details of all of these things. One thing I want to let you know, between services during the Love Seek Serve Hour, our kids are in here. We have a children's choir. They're going to sing on the 18th, which is super fun. Um, during that time, Pastor Eric is leading an Advent study downstairs. And so perhaps especially those those folks who are waiting while their kids are singing too, you know, um, feel free to wait and learn at the same time. But all, all are welcome. We'd love to, to have you there downstairs. Um, there's multiple studies to join. On Thursdays, uh, Pastor Eric's leading Advent prayer over lunch. And so we pray for the joys and concerns in our community um, and, and in the world as well. Um, coming up, there are <laughs> next Next Sunday, we have the nativity display. So during Love Seek Serve Hour, you'll be able to go downstairs and see different nativity scenes from folks in our congregation. Beer and carols, not tomorrow, but the next Monday. Super fun. Um, and cookie night, youth bake sale. 
Don't forget to invite someone to Christmas Eve worship. We would love to invite as many as we can to hear the good news that the light shines in the darkness. Um, there are, on a table out in the lobby, also there are some paper hands. Nancy Watson Pistol is kind of leading up a, a prayer hands for um, Dawn White, who uh, is is battling cancer. And so if you'd like to, to participate in that, there's a table in the lobby and you can send your, your well wishes on, on the hands. They will um, be hands of love given to, to the White family as well. So we want to, to be a part of that. Um, and then as we move into worship today, we are in a, a worship series called Come Home for Christmas, um, talking about what it means to come home to, to Christ, to come home to, to hope and peace and joy and love. You'll see that on the Advent wreath. Today we light the candles last week of hope and it'll join, this week we'll join um, the candle of peace as the light keeps shining a little bit brighter as we head uh, to Christmas um, uh, welcoming the birth of Jesus among us. Um, today we talk about a different kind of orientation to home. We're going to talk about the fear of home when home doesn't feel quite right um, and the mindfulness we have of others going through that, but, but what it means to prepare the way for a home for all. So um, that is where we'll be this, this day in worship. We are so glad that you are with us, that we are together, um, that we are here to worship, to worship God. Let's stand and sing together. Let's sing while we're waiting. While we are waiting, come. While we are waiting, come. Jesus, our Lord, amen. Now you know. Let's sing it again. While we are waiting, God. While we are waiting, God. Jesus, our Lord, Sing Jesus our Lord. Jesus our Lord, Emmanuel. While we are waiting, Be a friend in our loneliness. In our oasis for our searching. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Restore our joy, heal our wounds, and bring us peace.
This Advent, we remember the call to come home for Christmas. For many of us, the call to head home is for one of joy, hope, and love. We can't wait to reconnect with family, with history, and tradition. With a wonderful time of freedom and loving support, we can't wait to go home. There are also times when going home is not so good, not so healing. We are reminded of the times that we didn't fit in, when we didn't measure up, when we weren't loved like God loves us. Home can be a difficult place for some. Today we light the candle of peace with the candle of hope as a reminder that though the road is sometimes hard, we believe that one day there will be peace in every home. Will you pray with me? God of peace, we trust that you will bring peace on earth for all people. Help us prepare the way. Amen. together.
Children of the world, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Who you are on the inside, never asking you to hide. Jesus loves the little children of the parts of the service, isn't it? Our scripture today um, comes from Luke's gospel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We're going to take a look at John the Baptist. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Etureia, and Trachonidas, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness." He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For God, you are our rock and our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. So it is that time of year when free dates on the calendar seem to be few and far between, isn't it? Which in some ways is really, really nice because COVID kept all of those normal things from happening with as much gusto the last couple years. But I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm kind of relearning, relearning what the hustle and bustle of this season feels like this year. And the busyness doesn't feel as exhausting as it does energizing, because it's nice to have something to prepare for, right? And I recognize that probably sounds a little bad coming from the pastor, right? That there like maybe wasn't things to prepare for the last couple of years. Like besides the part, you know, when we don't have the parties, what's left of Christmas? But I know the whole Jesus part, right? I know the whole Jesus part. You can trust that. But there's something that, that builds the energy a little differently when we have all these outside things things, right? Like neighborhood potlucks and staff parties and gift exchanges and concerts and more. We have to check our calendars and evaluate what we are doing, what has to go, maybe even make some decisions about what won't fit. And sometimes that is a little bit of a detour from the picture-perfect Christmas preparations you had in mind. 
we got a, a text this week from my sister-in-law of our, our two nieces and our nephew, her kids, going to see Santa at a Cabela's where they live in South Carolina. Now, I have a, a little bit of a confession to make. Um, I am sort of delighted by the pictures of adorable kiddos who are terrified to take pictures with Santa. <laughs> I get that everyone is hoping for the cute Christmas card picture with like the matching velvet dresses, which is a step up from the scratchy dresses, you know, my sister and I wore. There's a picture of it when I was little, but still, I, I get that the backdrop is set and, and the movies make this, this moment and interaction seem magical and like the rite of passage that will make Christmas really feel like Christmas. But I'm pretty sure I will never not laugh when I see a picture of a kid terrified of the, the jolly cookie eating hero stranger beard man, right? I, I have some friends whose kids are no longer little. They're like in high school, um, but it's this picture of them when they're toddlers and they share it every year and they say the season is here um, where the older sisters are holding back the little one who's like, <laughs> You know, like I was trying to get away from from Santa, and um, and it's like just hilarious to me. The, but the real question, you know, is like, why do we not see this coming? Right? Like, maybe it should be a little a little weird, but but I'm a big I'm a big Santa fan. I don't, but I don't blame them in this in this situation. So my sister sends uh, sends us a photo of, of Ellie, the oldest, smiling while Santa holds baby Jack. He's doing fine. But little Miss Nora Ruth wasn't in the photo. Now, Nora rarely gets too far away from whatever big sister Ellie is up to. So it left us kind of wondering. And soon enough, their mom sent the next text. Well, Nora won't pose with Santa, but asked to pose with a mannequin instead. <laughs> And so we get two accompanying photos. One is Nora running away from Santa, looking over her shoulder like he's going to come after her. And, um, and then the next picture is sweet little Nora holding a bright red lolly, lollipop that matches her bright red, you know, dress that matches her sister's bright green dress, you know. But she's standing alone, big smile on her face. And she's all by herself, you know, unless you count the headless mannequin that is sporting cargo pants and a long sleeve t-shirt. <laughs> Nora Ruth. Here's the deal, St. Paul's. When we prepare for the birth of Christ in the world, it's okay if the normal Christmas stuff isn't okay with all of us. For Nora... It was the Cabela's Santa. But for you, it might be a myriad of other reasons. Maybe this season feels difficult because of the grief of who is missing this year. Maybe that's a person who has died in the last year. Maybe you are grieving the person you used to love, really being in it with you. Maybe your grief is that your kids or the kids in your life are grown and you're having to figure out new traditions. Maybe this season feels hard to connect with because Home for the Holidays isn't the, the squishy Hallmark movie that it is for some people. Pastor Andrea reminded us last week the, of that reality for so many people. For some, Christmas is a reminder that the family um, you have doesn't love, the, love you the way you need it. It's an ever-present dose of guilt that your relationship with the, the home for Christmas typical folks is a mess at best and broken at worst. Or maybe it's a magnifying glass on your parenting style, you know? Home for Christmas can be hard. Maybe this season is hard because you feel like you're walking on eggshells around the sadness of others, and it's hard to know if you're allowed to enjoy the magic of the season or if you should shrink a little bit to be sure that there is space for everyone. Maybe you aren't feeling quite at home this season because it's extroversion to the max and you are exhausted. But what we receive in scripture today is a bit of a roadmap 
from John the Baptist as he helps us prepare the way for a home for all that never leaves us out of place. He helps us prepare the way and make space for welcoming Jesus that that leaves room for all of us right where we are. So John the Baptist and Jesus are are so closely connected in their lives and their stories. We learn almost as much about John's birth as we do about Jesus' birth. John is, you know, the cousin of Jesus born to Zechariah and Elizabeth, who Mary goes to see when she's pregnant, and they are radiantly thrilled to welcome him. Zechariah even has this prophecy that has been turned into a song about his son, John. And the part I want us to remember today, as the peace candle burns, is that John was going to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. He's going to shine upon them to guide our feet into the way of peace. John came to be a light in the darkness to guide our feet toward peace. So maybe we should listen, right? Grown-up John does just that in our scripture today. When Luke has John speaking, he is quoting from Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways be made smooth, and all the flesh shall see the salvation of God. Isaiah was written to the Jewish community in Babylon in the 6th century BCE, consoling the people that their exile, their displacement, you know, would end soon. Isaiah is basically saying, get up and get ready to go home. A voice is shouting, prepare the way of the Lord. Go and build a highway because you are going home. Scholars remind us that ancient texts didn't have commas or quotation marks. Hebrew even lacked vowels. So the way the sentences are formed by Luke actually makes a difference in how we understand it. And so for Luke, Isaiah reads, prepare the way of the Lord. And in Isaiah, the, the way is a road. But for Luke, for Luke, the term way is the term the early followers of Jesus used as a self-reference. They didn't call themselves Christians, but rather followers of the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. So prepare yourself, right? So John's reading of Isaiah would be heard by Luke's readers as a reference to the Christian path and walk. In Isaiah, this was telling people to build a highway in the desert to show the end of exile, a way home. And for Luke, it's about John the baptizer, the one who baptizes, right, out in the desert, preparing people for Jesus to come a different kind of home. And when Luke says the valleys are, are, you know, straightened, that the the mountains are are made low, this is the same kind of humbling as Mary sings about in the Magnificat. She says the powerful will be brought down from their thrones, the lowly lifted up. It's a different kind of home. What we hear is is that John is proclaiming that we need to prepare the way for the Lord, and that way is going to look really, really different. And what is incredible news to those for whom the way the world works, um, that is incredible news for, for people who the world's not working for right now, right? For those who feel in the dark. And that brings us to the list of really hard-to-pronounce leaders (laughs) at the beginning of our reading today. Understanding those leaders help us know what kind of world John the Baptist is, is speaking the good news into. We have Tiberius and Pontius Pilate, Herod, Antipas, Philip, Lysanias, Annas, and Caiaphas. And they were all powerful leaders, but settling them into their reality is really helpful, and clearly Luke wanted us to pay attention to it. Um, But it's most helpful in knowing that the kingdom Jesus preached was not the reality that was experienced under these rulers. Tiberius was pretty terrible. He had a reputation for killing anyone who disagreed with him and a reputation for prolonged sexual abuse of women and children. He exiled Jews for their faith. Luke's hearers would have known that. This is darkness. 
Pontius Pilate comes next. We've probably heard of him. He's, he's probably the, the most famous of this list of rulers because he's been paired with a creed, you know, that is so familiar to most Christians. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, etc. This is darkness. Herod Antipas is one of the, the terrible line of Herods. Most Herods were bad guys when we read about them. Herod Antipas in particular gets the prize for being the one who goes on to murder John the Baptist by beheading him. This is darkness. The last few names were a little less terrible. It's not, you know, it's pretty easy to get there, right? A little less terrible, but, but leaders nonetheless. And naming all of them shows how they were preparing for Jesus to speak to the larger systems, not just individual situations. If we're preparing for one who can speak to the the powers that be and the world they create, we are preparing to usher in a better home for all of us. It's a systemic preparation, not just an individual. And they are set in real places in real time. For Luke, that's going to matter for the good news to feel like good news. It's got to be real. It has to make a difference in our real lives. I like Luke, right? So we have all these leaders in high places, and then the text is is like there's, there's, then there's John, and he's in the wilderness. So it's a real place, but it's so clear that it's supposed to stand out. John is a wild guy who eats locusts and honey. He is not like the, you know, the likely powerful voice to have his influence come in with, with people like Tiberius and Herod, right? But as Amy Jill Levine, a scholar, says, one voice in the wilderness can be as powerful as Caesar and Lysanias and Caiaphas and Philip. And that powerful voice says to get prepared for Jesus to come and change the world, to be a place for all, where everyone will see salvation, the salvation of God. Now, this is where the whole quoting from Isaiah part switches us back to, to Luke's time. Because in Isaiah's, you know, not everyone had seen the salvation of God, and they knew that. <laughs> so we bring that into today's reality, which is not too different than how we read scripture, right? Or to Luke's reality, I should say. So, so the good news is, is, is made for that time. A.J. Levine uh, explains that salvation here has a couple different meanings. It can be reduced into something like getting into heaven, that sort of viewpoint. It can. We can get there. However, in Luke, it also always suggests some sort of comfort, hope, and healing that comes from Jesus' teachings and and healings. Um, The first time someone speaks of salvation presently in Luke happens when Jesus heals a sinful woman and says, Go, your faith has saved you. And as Luke and Acts, because Acts is also written with Luke, it's like part two, um, as Luke and Acts unfold, what we see is how much salvation is linked with ethical behavior. And it's not as much like a works righteousness thing that your behavior saves you as it is an acknowledgement that your behavior is a product of salvation, right? Just like John says we prepare for Jesus and quotes Isaiah saying that the valley will be lifted and mountains made low, we are to to realize that a world with Jesus is going to lead to the kind of salvation that changes us in ways that mirror the good news Jesus brings. So I want to take you back to my niece Nora Ruth and her fear of the typical Santa lap Christmas. Is it just a coincidence that she wants to pose with a headless mannequin to make Christmas feel a little bit more like what John the Baptist, man who is beheaded by Herod Antipas, proclaims? Nora Ruth and the headless mannequin Christmas might just be the good news reminder for the rest of us this Christmas. Home for Christmas doesn't need to look like it does for everyone else. Salvation and safety and joy might be weird to the rest of us, or we might be weird to everybody else, but some of what preparing for Jesus in our hearts and our lives and in the world looks like is naming that our situations aren't okay with us as they are. And making change that feels at home in our hearts with ourselves because of God's stirring within us. So at Christmas, maybe that looks like different boundaries 
around our time for you or scheduling a therapist for the new year because you know you want that or diving into your church home and, and to let your faith be nurtured which can look like everything from prayer over lunch on Thursdays to, to beer and carols um, or to inviting your neighbors to Christmas Eve who might not know that there is a home for them to reading the devotional at, online every morning. But whatever your preparation looks like this season, let's make sure we are honest about the reality we're living in. For Luke, he named Tiberius and Pilate and Herod and more. For Nora Ruth, she named Freaky Santa at Cabela's. You know what freaks you out right now. You know what bubbles up your anxiety and uncertainty. You know what has reason to break your heart. Now, get some John the Baptist permission giving, way preparing, different way of of going toward the peace of Christ and find yourself a headless mannequin to remind you or whatever makes you remember that the world will be different and that's a promise. That is the waiting we remember in Advent and that is what we turn to in the meantime. May it be so. In the name of the creator, the redeemer, the sustainer of us all. Amen. I'm missing the offering plates. That is interesting. <laughs> okay, we're missing the offering plates. We'll get them. It's fine. Um, so we come to the time where we respond to God's word together, that we... Um, that we come and we light a candle in prayer, that we, uh, um, we pray to God. Um, and, and every time during Advent, I think we're especially mindful of the, the flames, right? So maybe today this is your candle of peace um, and that you can let it, let it shine that way. Uh, we also go to God in generosity. I will find the offering plates, I promise, because I would never want to hold you back from, from the gift it is to give to God generously. Thank you so much. What a gift. What a gift. Let us go to God in prayer and generosity. Christ, whose glory fills the skies, Christ, the everlasting light, Son of righteousness, arise and triumph o'er these shades of night. Come the
Friends, this is good news. Christ our Lord invites all to his table who want to love God, grow in the way of peace with our neighbors, receive God's love for us. So at this table, we have an invitation, an invitation that comes from Jesus to all. At this table, we also get to make an invitation together that we get to invite God into our lives. Emmanuel, God with us. We get to invite one another. And so I I hope that you hear that invitation and that you make it. You have one response today. Is this a participatory meal? And that'll just be, O come, O come, Emmanuel. So here, friends, we lift our hearts to God, praying, come, Lord Jesus. O come, O come, Emmanuel. All glory and honor to you, O Lord, for the promise of your saving love. New life and hope spring forth from the stump of Jesse's tree, a world where wolf and lamb, leopard and kid, lion and calf will live together in safety and peace, and a little child will lead us. We lift our hearts, God, to you, praying, come, Lord Jesus, O come, O come, Emmanuel. All glory and honor to you, O Lord, for by your grace you've come to us and you are coming again. You sent us a Savior, one who delights in worshiping you, brings equity and justice to people who are humble and poor, one who's destroyed the power of death and will be faithful and righteous forever. And on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, Jesus, our Emmanuel, took bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and shared it with his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this and remember me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and shared it again with his friends and said, Drink of this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this every time you drink it. Remember me. So God, we do. We remember your promises and we rejoice in your presence. 
we offer the sacrifice of praise and we lift our hearts to you, praying, come, Lord Jesus. O come, O come, Emmanuel. All glory and honor to you, O Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and wonder. Pour out your spirit upon us on this heavenly banquet until the earth is full of your glory like the waters that cover the sea. Here, God, we lift our hearts to you, praying, come, Lord Jesus. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Jesus, Emmanuel, God's presence in our midst promised to be with us always. And so we join with Jesus in praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, all are welcome at this table. You're invited. I invite you to make an invitation in this time too.
song together. an announcement and the announcement so can we borrow your mic real quick Dave Platt is on in Staff Parish and he has an announcement to make and it has nothing to do with K-State's win yesterday <laughs> nothing I'm not going to bring it up I'm not going to say a word you can talk to me about it afterward though uh, just a quick reminder uh, I think soon I've been here since 1989 and I think all but maybe one or two of those years, we have done a staff love offering uh, this time of year for our staff just to thank them for uh, all they do for us. And uh, over these last few years, it seems particularly <laughs> important given that, that sort of the extra mile that we've asked them all to uh, do in light of everything uh, we've been through together. So um, if you would like to do that, uh, you're welcome to put a check in the ma uh, check in the plate. You just make sure, or an envelope with some cash. Just make sure you you note on that check or on the envelope that is for the staff love offering. Uh, the other thing I would invite you to do that I know they all appreciate would be just a, a quick note, uh, just thanking them for uh, the particular things perhaps they've done for for you or your family here over the last year. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> I want to remind you also, Kids Choir will be here between services, and Pastor Eric will lead Love Seek Serve Hour downstairs if you want to um, study together and uh, get your home for Christmas uh, uh, small group kind of time on as well. Um, head downstairs. He'd love to have you. As we go from this place, may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit go with us now and always that we might look for the signs, the headless mannequins, whatever permission giving we need to know that, that the world can be different and it is okay to embrace and to prepare for Christ coming in the world. Um, however, the Spirit moves us. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Yeah. 